Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the fifth lecture of the course ADR and arbitration this lecture is on the second part of our discussion on arbitration agreement now if you recall in the previous lecture in the previous session I introduced the idea of arbitration agreement we referred to section 7 to understand what are the essential attributes of a valid arbitration agreement we also saw as to what is the tribunal we are referring to. It is a private tribunal created by the parties on the basis of consent of the parties to pass an enforceable order acting in a judicial manner. So that is the subject matter. I said arbitration agreement is the most important thing because unless you have that, you cannot start arbitration. I also mentioned, if you remember, that if you have an agreement, you will be compelled to go for arbitration because if you want to commit breach and want to go to some, some court, court is obliged to send you back for arbitration. So arbitration agreement cannot be breached. Or we can say the remedy for breach of an arbitration agreement is specific performance of arbitration agreement. We also saw the difference between an arbitration agreement and an agreement for expert determination the basic thing is that court, while trying to understand the nature of the document in question, will have to conduct an objective inquiry into the intention of the parties as to what parties must have intended at the time when they entered into the contract. So that is one. Now we will be talking about the second part of our discussion on arbitration agreement. And I will be discussing two important issues here. One is called incorporation by reference. And the other is called two-tier arbitration, whether two-tier arbitration clauses are valid in India or not. So after the lecture, you will be in a position to understand what is the meaning of incorporation of an arbitration clause by reference. And second, you will be in a position to, to answer whether a two-tier arbitration agreement is valid under Indian law or not. Right. So let's start the first thing, incorporation by reference. This is part of section 7 itself. We have done first four subsections of section 7. An arbitration agreement is an agreement to arbitrate present or future disputes. It, has, it, it can be part of the main contract. It can be in the form of an independent agreement. Whatever may be the case, it has its independent existence. Then we said the agreement must be in writing. What do we mean by a written arbitration agreement? It means three things. If it is actually written, it must be signed by the parties. If it is there in the form of correspondence between the parties, then there must be some permanent record of that correspondence. I also said it can arise out of claim and defense statement. So these are the points which we have already discussed. Now we have section 7, subsection 5, which incorporates this principle called as incorporation by reference. It means incorporating an arbitration clause in a contract by reference to another document containing an arbitration clause. Try and understand what happens in businesses when same companies are transacting, when same persons are doing business time and again, they prefer not to enter into detailed contract every time. Every time what they will do, they will uh, write few clauses and they will refer to their own earlier contract and say rest of the terms shall be according to that earlier contract between A and, B, A and B. So that is how they save their time. So instead of reproducing those terms and conditions every time, it is a wise idea to include some of the clauses and then for rest of the clauses, if you think same terms and conditions will be good enough, you can borrow those terms and conditions in the new contract by referring to an old contract. This, is, this idea is called incorporation by reference. You are referring to a document so as to include terms and conditions of that document to a new contract. This principle finds place in section 7 subsection 5 of Indian Act 
as i said it means incorporating an arbitration clause in a new contract by reference to another document which contains an arbitration clause you can do the same for any other terms and conditions of the contract you can do with respect to arbitration clause also now prior to the 1996 arbitration conciliation act the old 1940 law did not contain something similar to what we have in 75 but then there were cases in which courts have invented this principle for example in the 1975 judgment of modern buildings versus limmer modern buildings versus limmer 1975 the court observed where parties by an agreement import the terms of some other document as part of their agreement those terms must be imported in their entirety but subject to this that if any of the imported terms in any way conflicts with the expressly agreed terms the latter must prevail over what would otherwise be imported there are three points which i will talk mention about this paragraph in modern buildings versus limmer court says it is possible to borrow clauses from some other contract by simply referring to that earlier contract it is possible so incorporation by reference was recognized in 1975 itself in the case of modern buildings but subject to two conditions if you see first condition is that the clause which you want to borrow must be borrowed in its entirety you cannot modify and bring it you cannot bring part of that clause so first condition is if you want to borrow some clauses from some other contract borrow it in its entirety and second when you borrow it to the new agreement by referring to that earlier contract if it becomes part of the new contract and if there is a conflict between borrowed agreement borrowed clause and any of the clauses of new agreement then the new agreement clause shall prevail over the borrowed clause these are the two conditions so what i'm saying 75 was not there prior to 1996 but still there there are cases i i mentioned the case of modern buildings 1975 in the court in which the courts agreed that incorporation by reference is possible you can refer to some other contract and incorporate the terms subject to conditions the clause must be borrowed in its entirety one two if there is a conflict between borrowed clause and some agreed upon terms then agreed upon terms here in the new agreement shall prevail over borrowed clause there are other cases also for example in 1987 supreme court judgment of elementa sa elementa sa versus national agriculture cooperative marketing federation of india limited in elementa case also the principle of incorporation by reference was recognized by the supreme court so therefore something which now finds legislative status by virtue of inclusion in section 7 subsection 5 it very much existed even prior to 1996 act but there are certain conditions subject to which you have the freedom to borrow you can borrow the terms from some other contract subject to certain conditions first there must be an express or implied reference in the main contract to document containing the arbitration clause so if your contract is document x there must be reference in x about a document say y from which you want to borrow the arbitration clause there must be either express or implied reference in your new agreement reference of what reference of some other contract from which you want to borrow the arbitration clause so there has to be reference point number 1 2 there must be words of incorporation words of incorporation which are sufficient to borrow the clause what do i mean by that in my agreement i am writing that a will pay rupees x to b b will deliver the goods to this and then i say rest of the terms of the contract 
rest of the conditions of performance of contract shall be according to terms of contract A. So there is reference and there are words of incorporation. So there must be reference in the new agreement about some other contract. There must be words of incorporation. Third, the borrowed clause must be fit in the new context. The borrowed clause must be sufficient to resolve disputes arising out of this new contract. I will give you an illustration very soon. And the fourth is the borrowed clause must not be repugnant to agreed upon terms. This is already discussed in Modern Buildings versus Limer. There must not be any inconsistency between borrowed clause and agreed upon terms. So there must be reference. There must be clear words of incorporation. The borrowed clause must be fit in the new context, should be sufficient to resolve disputes arising out of new contract. And fourth, there must not be inconsistency between borrowed clause and agreed upon terms. Subject to these conditions, 7.5, section 7, subsection 5, allows parties to incorporate arbitration clause from some other contract by referring to that contract. There is another case in the form of illustration, of course. The case is Hamilton and Company. Hamilton and Company versus McKee and Sons. I will be using two words here. One is called charter party. The other is called bill of lading. Charter party is an agreement. When you take a vessel on lease, when you take a ship on lease, you enter into a contract with the owner of the ship, which is known as charter party. Let's keep it simple. So you entered into an agreement with the owner of the ship. You entered into a charter party. And when you enter into a charter party, you at the same time enter into a document called as bill of lading, which is an agreement between the consigner of goods, the person who is sending his goods through ship carriage, consigner of goods and the captain of the ship. So bill of lading is a document between consigner of goods and captain of the ship. Bill of lading is a document of title. It is something similar to Bilty, which you must have signed when you uh, transport your goods through road transport or rail receipt, which you get when you transport your goods using rail transport. So something similar to Bilty or something similar to rail receipt is what we call as bill of lading. That's also a document of title. Whoever has that bill of lading will have the title on, on the goods. So that's not uh, important for me. There were two documents in this case. One is charter party, the other is bill of lading. Bill of lading says all other terms after mentioning few clauses, bill of lading rights, parties agreed and wrote that all other terms and conditions as per charter party. So A is the consigner, B is the owner of ship, C is the captain of ship. There is a contract between A and C, which is called bill of lading. And there is a contract between A and B, which is called charter party. In bill of lading, after writing few clauses, parties agreed and wrote that all other terms and conditions are same as per charter party. So therefore, for all other terms, you refer to charter party. See those terms, the same will be applicable to bill of lading. That is the idea. Now, a dispute arose out of bill of lading out of the agreement between A and C, the consigner and captain of the ship. When dispute arose, the same was to be referred for arbitration. But there was no arbitration clause in bill of lading. It says for other terms and conditions, look into charter party. So therefore, we have to look into charter party. When you read the charter party, there is a dispute resolution clause. So by, in, by reference, this dispute resolution clause is incorporated in bill of lading. Now you take these clauses, include it in bill of lading and read the bill of lading now. This bill of lading entered on this date, this bill of lading is party A, is party B, bill of lading. 
go on, go on, go on and then you have a clause. Any dispute arising out of this charter shall be resolved by way of arbitration. This is not charter. This is bill of lading. So, if you recall, I said the third point here, incorporation by reference, the conditions. The third point I mentioned that the terms, borrowed terms must be fit in the new context. The borrowed clause must be good to resolve the disputes arising out of new agreement. Now, in this case, the borrowed clause reads that any dispute arising out of this charter shall be resolved by way of arbitration. This is an absolutely misfit in the new context because the new document is not charter party, it is bill of lading. And we have already discussed that the clause cannot be modified and incorporated. The clause has to be incorporated, borrowed in its entirety. We mentioned this point in the case of modern building versus limer. So therefore, the borrowed clause is misfit. It is not good enough to resolve disputes arising out of this new contract. And therefore, the situation is as if there is no arbitration clause in the bill of lading. Right? The situation is because the incorporation is not valid. The borrowed clause will not be considered as incorporated clause. And therefore, there is no arbitration clause. Thus, if a dispute arises, the parties do not have any option but to go for suit, but to go to a court and claim remedy, claim damages. Cannot, the matter cannot be referred for arbitration because arbitration clause does not stand borrowed. Whatever was borrowed is misfit in the new context. Now, if you slightly change the our dispute resolution clause of the charter party. If I slightly change it, instead of writing that any dispute arising out of this charter, the same shall be referred to arbitration. If you write any dispute arising out of this contract, the same shall be referred for arbitration. And if you borrow it here in bill of lading, it reads any dispute arising out of this contract shall be referred for arbitration. It is good because bill of lading is a contract. Charter party is also a contract. Therefore, Therefore, keep in mind, refer to only those documents which contain an arbitration clause which will be good in the new context. And then only you can say that your incorporation is valid. This is what I mean by incorporation by reference. There are a few developments. I will talk about few cases here. We have understood what is there in section 7, subsection 5. We understand the case of modern building versus limer. Elementa SA, we understand the condition subject to which incorporation by reference shall be done and the illustration of bill of lading and charter party. I am sure you understand it. Messrs. Inox Wind Limited versus Messrs. Thermo Cables Limited, 2018 Supreme Court. Now, what happened in this case is suppose I am a manufacturer of wind turbine generators. And in order to manufacture my wind turbine generators, I need some cables which I will procure from you. You are the manufacturer and seller of those cables. Now, when I have to purchase those cables from you, there was a purchase order issued. And according to the purchase order, the supply of cables was to be done in accordance with the terms mentioned in the purchase order. There are terms mentioned in the purchase order and the supply of goods, supply of cables has to be done according to the terms mentioned in the purchase order and also the standard terms and conditions that were attached to the purchase order. These are standard terms and conditions which belong to one party, the purchaser. These are standard terms and conditions that belong to one party. So, what is the story finally? The story is you will be supplying goods to me and the supply shall be done according to terms and conditions mentioned in the purchase order. Not only that, it shall be done according to standard terms and conditions. Those are standard terms and conditions of one party which have been attached to the purchase order. What happens generally is if I am regularly procuring goods in order to prepare or manufacture the machines which I have to supply to my buyers. 
if I am regularly procuring material, instead of writing terms and conditions in every contract, what I will do? I will prepare my standard terms, my standard conditions. And I will enter into contract on the basis of these standard terms and conditions. So whatever contract I do with any supplier, I will add these terms and conditions and say that these are part of the main contract. So I don't write it again and again. I refer to the standard terms, but these are not standard terms of the industry. These are my standard terms on which I do business. So therefore, supply has to be done according to the terms mentioned in the purchase order as well as my standard terms and conditions which are annexed there too. Now, apart from other terms, one of the terms in the standard terms and conditions is arbitration clause. One of the terms in standard terms and conditions is dispute resolution clause. Now, what happened is you made supply of those cables and I discovered that there are cracks in the cables and therefore I wrote to you that you will have to replace these cables. Suppose you are denying, I will like to invoke the arbitration clause because a dispute has come into existence. I want to refer that dispute for arbitration. Now when I wanted to invoke the arbitration clause, you are saying that the purchase order does not have any arbitration clause, so therefore the matter cannot be referred for arbitration. You need to have an arbitration agreement for arbitration. Since purchase order does not have it, you cannot appoint arbitrators, you cannot invoke any arbitration clause, there cannot be any arbitration between you and me. Now when there is no consensus on appointment of arbitrators, what happens is, in case when there is no consensus as to how the arbitration must start, what should we do for appointment of arbitrators? The parties are not agreeing on some names. Then what happens? Either party can write to the Supreme Court or the High Court. Either party can request the Supreme Court or the High Court under Section 11. And the Supreme Court or the High Court will appoint arbitrator for you. This is the mechanism. We'll discuss, we'll have a discussion on appointment procedure also. Uh, maybe after one or two lectures, we will talk about appointment procedure of section 11. We'll talk about it in detail. Under what circumstances you will approach Supreme Court, under what circumstances you will approach High Court, all those things will come. So the point is, in the instant case, there was no agreement, there was problem. I am saying there is a dispute. I am referring to some arbitration clause in standard terms and conditions. You are saying that there is no arbitration clause, even if there is a dispute, because there is no arbitration clause, you cannot refer the matter for arbitration. I am suggesting a name, let's appoint Mr. X as the arbitrator. You are saying, forget about Mr. X, we do not consider there to be any arbitration agreement in existence. There is no agreement at all. So therefore, I requested the, the High Court, I requested the High Court to appoint an arbitrator. Now, High Court rejected my request on the ground that there does not exist any arbitration agreement. There is a purchase order, few terms and conditions are there on the purchase order between you and me. And I have annexed my standard terms. Arbitration clause is part of my standard terms. I have written in my agreement that supply shall be done according to purchase order and the standard terms and conditions annexed there too. I assume that I have annexed the standard terms and conditions, so therefore, Dispute resolution clause, the arbitration clause has become part of the main contract. But High Court says, no, this is not good enough. You are saying supply shall be done according to terms and conditions annexed there too. That will not be sufficient to incorporate standard terms and conditions related to dispute resolution. The arbitration clause cannot be borrowed by making a general reference to some other document. 
The arbitration clause can be borrowed in this case only by making specific reference to arbitration clause. What High Court says, instead of writing that supply shall be done according to standard terms and conditions, this is a general reference to that document. If you wanted arbitration agreement to be borrowed, you should have written that dispute resolution clause shall be same as the one in standard terms and conditions. Make a specific reference to that clause. Since you did not make a specific reference, therefore general reference to standard terms and conditions of one of the parties will not be sufficient and therefore nothing is incorporated. At least the arbitration clause is not incorporated in purchase order between contract between the two parties. And thus, since there is no arbitration clause, there cannot be any arbitration. And therefore, we are declining your request to appoint an arbitrator. In the process, High Court relied on an earlier judgment of Supreme Court, a 2009 judgment of Supreme Court called as MR Engineers and Contractors Private Limited versus Som that builders, in which Supreme Court talked about general reference and special reference, these two aspects. What court says in MR engineers? There are two points you can note down. First is, when the parties enter into a contract, listen to me carefully, these two points are important, which Supreme Court in MR engineers held. When the parties enter into a contract, making a general reference to another contract, such general reference would not have the effect of incorporating the arbitration clause from the referred document into the contract between the parties. The arbitration clause stands incorporated only by a specific reference. So if you and me are referring to some contract, that's a general reference. That general reference will not be sufficient to incorporate the arbitration clause. You will have to specifically refer to arbitration clause in order to incorporate it in your new contract. Second point, when the contract provides that standard form terms and conditions of an independent trade or professional institution will bind them, such terms shall be deemed to be incorporated by reference. You must have heard there are certain institutions which prescribe standard business terms. For example, uh, if, if I deal in coffee, if there is a seller and buyer of coffee, they will have to enter into a contract which complies with the standard terms of co coffee board, for example. There are institutions as a coffee board, tea board. These institutions will have their standard terms and conditions. These are industry standards. Anybody doing business in these areas will have to do the business according to those standard terms and conditions of those institutions. Court says if you are referring to standard terms and conditions of institution, that should be sufficient. That is fine. That is acceptable. And a general reference to standard terms and conditions of an institution would be sufficient to borrow even the arbitration clause from those terms and conditions. Why? Because it can be presumed that anybody who is dealing in those goods must be familiar with standard terms of the institution working in that field. So if it is coffee board, the standard terms of coffee board can be referred and any merchant dealing in coffee is expected to know those terms. So there are two points, if you are referring to some other contract, make a specific reference, only then arbitration clause stands borrowed. Two, when you are referring to standard terms and conditions, standard conditions can be referred and if you want to bring arbitration clause, it is possible only when you make specific reference. But if these are standard terms of the institution to which both the parties are members and both the parties must be familiar with the standard terms, in that case general reference would be sufficient. So the idea behind 
the the discussion here is if these are standard terms of one of the parties you don't expect the other party to know about these standard terms and therefore a general reference to these standard terms will not be sufficient to in, to to borrow the arbitration clause however if these are standard terms of an institution to which both the parties are members then as you can expect them to know about the standard terms even a general reference to these standard terms and conditions would be sufficient to borrow the arbitration clause this was the judgment of mr engineers and high court in messrs inox wind limited relied on on mr engineers to hold that a general reference to standard terms of one of the parties will not be sufficient to borrow the arbitration clause and therefore there is no arbitration clause and they rejected the petition request filed under section 11 to appoint an arbitrator the matter goes to supreme court supreme court discusses four illustrations first if you see there are four illustrations these are mentioned here a and b incorporate standard terms now these standard terms can be of any institution to which both the parties are members or can be of one of the parties standard terms of say seller so a and b in their contract incorporate standard terms of institution or one of the parties second a and b incorporate terms previously agreed between a and b themselves so me and you are writing a new contract we already had a contract we did business in past so we are not writing everything again we are referring to our own earlier contract it is our own earlier contract both of us are presumed to know about it third illustration a and b incorporate terms agreed between a and c or b and c a and b you and me a and b incorporate terms from a contract between either a and c or b and c and fourth a and b incorporate terms agreed between c and d out of these four situations supreme court in messrs inox wind limited said that general reference would be sufficient in first two cases see this is an important step ahead court moved ahead of what was held in mr engineers the first point as i said has two aspects a and b incorporate standard terms of institution that is permissible in mr engineers itself a general reference would be sufficient to incorporate arbitration clause now in inox court moves a step forward and says if a and b refer to standard terms of one of the parties even in that case we will accept general reference to be good enough to borrow the arbitration clause so that is the change in approach so for first point for second point it is now presumed that parties know the referred terms and conditions and since they are familiar with referred terms and conditions the referred terms and conditions are borrowed to the new contract even by general reference so therefore in first two cases general reference is good enough to borrow the arbitration clause but in last two cases where a and b are referring to a contract between a and c or b and c and a and b are referring to a contract between c and d these are the two cases which according to the supreme court in inox wind limited case in these two cases general reference would not be sufficient to borrow the arbitration clause in order to borrow the clause you will have to make a specific reference first two cases are called as single contract cases where last two situations point number 3 and 4 are not single contract situation there is one more development taking place happening here in 2022 karnataka high court in a case called as best pay solutions private limited versus 
Messrs. Razor Pay Software Private Limited. A party can invoke the arbitration clause contained in an agreement with respect to the dispute arising with a third party under another agreement if both the agreements refer to each other and form one composite transaction. What I am trying to say here is, go back to the previous slide, look at point number 3, A and B incorporate terms agreed between A and C or between B and C. So, we are referring to an earlier contract where one of the parties to this new contract was a member. One of the parties of this new contract was a party to that earlier contract. In, in MR Engineers, in INOX, in both these cases, Supreme Court said, in order to borrow the arbitration clause here, a specific reference is required. Now, in the Karnataka High Court judgment, which I just mentioned, 2022, the Karnataka High Court says, even in this situation, general reference would be sufficient. Even in this situation, general reference would be sufficient, provided it is a composite transaction. Provided it is a composite transaction, meaning thereby, performance of this contract also depends on performance of this contract. So, if I am making some machine, I am relying on this earlier contract between one of the parties and the supplier for procurement. So, A is manufacturer of machine, B is supplying some instruments. So, there is a contract between A and B. B is procuring some raw material from C. There is a contract between A and C. There is a contract between B and C. B is referring to his responsibility towards me in his contract with C and performance of this contract decides performance of this new contract. So, if these two are interrelated, if one is linked with other, then in that situation, if these two put together is a composite contract, in that situation, it is possible to refer to a contract between B and C in a contract between A and B. And even in that case, general reference would be sufficient to borrow the arbitration clause. So, what I am saying is, even in case of point number 3, now the law is going to be diluted. And in first three points, a general reference to some contract would be sufficient to borrow the arbitration clause. It is only in the fourth point that you need to make a specific reference to arbitration clause if you want to borrow arbitration clause to the new agreement. This is law on incorporation by reference. So, we have understood what is there in section 7.5. It incorporates a principle of law of incorporation by reference. It was earlier there in the form of case law, modern building versus limer, elementa essay. Then we saw how MR engineers, in the case of MR engineers, Supreme Court laid down the idea of general reference, specific reference. And finally, in INOX, how, in the case of INOX, how Supreme Court expands the principle. And out of four illustrations, now we understand in first three, general reference would be good enough to borrow the arbitration clause. It is only when A and B are referring to a contract between C and D that you need to have specific reference to arbitration clause in order to borrow it. The second aspect which I wanted to take up is two-tier arbitration agreement, uh, the validity of two-tier arbitration agreement. And this question arose in the case of Messrs. Centro Trade Minerals and Metal Incorporated versus Hindustan Copper Limited 2016. In fact, it arose before a two judges bench and because a serious question of law was involved, so therefore the bench referred it to a larger bench and that larger bench decision came in 2016, which is reported in 2016 SCC Online Supreme Court 1482. Now, before we talk about two-tier arbitration, let us see what was that clause which was in question in the case of Centro Trade Minerals and Metals Incorporated versus 
Hindustan Copper Limited. I will read this clause. You, you listen to me carefully because we will examine whether it is a valid agreement or not, whether such agreements are acceptable under Indian law or not. It says, all disputes or differences whatsoever arising between the parties out of or relating to the construction, meaning and operation or effect of the contract or the breach thereof shall be settled by arbitration in India through the arbitration panel of the Indian Council of Arbitration in accordance with the rules of arbitration of Indian Council of Arbitration. This is an arbitration clause which provides for institutional arbitration. It refers to the institution called as Indian Council of Arbitration. It says that the arbitration panel shall be appointed by the Indian Council of Arbitration in accordance with the rules of arbitration of Indian Council of Arbitration. This is part one. So in case any dispute arises, the same shall be referred to arbitration and arbitration shall be done according to rules of Indian Council of Arbitration. Now that is not problematic. The second part creates trouble because it says if either party is in disagreement with the arbitration result in India, the first part, whatever is the result of arbitration done in India according to the rules of Indian Council of Arbitration. If either party is in disagreement with the arbitration result in India, either party will have the right to appeal to a second arbitration in London, UK in accordance with rules of conciliation and arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce in effect on the date hereof and the result of this second arbitration will be binding on both the parties. So what is the real issue here? Parties created an appeal mechanism within the arbitration clause. Parties created a two-tier arbitration clause. We can have a multi-tier arbitration clause. We can have a second appeal. But does Indian law allow for these appeals and multi-tier arbitration clauses? That was the question. So if a dispute arises, you do it in India according to some institution, which is Indian institution, according to the rules of that institution. Whatever is the result, if both the parties are satisfied, there is no challenge, no appeal, it is binding, final, that's it. But if either of the party is not satisfied with the arbitration result, arbitration result, what is that arbitration result? The result of first arbitration. If either of us is not satisfied with the arbitration result, then we have the right to appeal to a second arbitration. Now, the second arbitration is to be done in London. The location changes. And this second arbitration is to be done in London according to an international institution, international institution called as International Chamber of Commerce, according to the rules of ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. Certain issues came before the court. The first issue was the word arbitration result. As mentioned here in the previous slide, you see in the second paragraph, if either party is in disagreement with the arbitration result in India, the argument raised was the decision in the first place, which is to be made by an Indian institution, is not an award. It is not an award. Because had it been award, they would have used the word award in the arbitration clause. It is something other than award. So once the first stage decision itself does not lead to an award, the whole process cannot be called as arbitration. That was an argument. But court says that arbitration result, even if it is not called as an award in the arbitration clause, is still an award. Why? Because it is passed by an arbitral tribunal to be appointed by an institution, arbitral institution, after following rules of arbitration. So ultimately the result has to be an award. You call it an arbitration result or whatever. So it is an award. If you don't call it an award, 
then how will you enforce this arbitration result? Because there is always a possibility that none of the parties go in appeal. If parties do not go in appeal, then this remains the final decision which is to be enforced. So if you do not call it an award, how will you enforce it? Because under Arbitration Conciliation Act, only an award can be enforced. Therefore, the arbitration result of first stage arbitration is also an award. And if it is not challenged in second stage arbitration in London, then that result becomes the, the final binding result. And therefore, in order to enforce it, you will have to accept it as an award. So that ground is, that argument was dismissed. There are significant challenges. For example, it was argued that appeal can only be statutory. Appeal mechanism can only be created by statute. There cannot be contractual appeal mechanism. You find possibility of appeal in CPC. Can parties enter into a contract and provide for appeal mechanism? Court said yes. Court said yes, because we are not talking about litigation. In litigation, you cannot increase number of appeals or reduce number of appeals by contract. Because the appeal provisions are fixed in Code of Civil Procedure. When can there be review? When, when can there be appeal? When can there be revision? All these aspects are fixed. Cannot be modified by contract. But we are not talking about litigation and therefore there is nothing in Arbitration Conciliation Act which prohibits parties from entering into an agreement which provide for appeal. So therefore, this ground, this argument that you cannot have appeal mechanism unless it is provided by statute is not acceptable with respect to Arbitration and Conciliation Act. It is good in case of litigation. The third argument was two-tier arbitration agreement is not sanctioned by the Act. And in fact, it is prohibited by the Act. There are certain observations of Supreme Court in this case. For example, court says that the ancestral working group, the ancestral working group on international contract practices has observed that there is wide support for the view that award may be appealed before another tribunal. It is not something entirely new which we are talking about. In past also, there are observations where bodies have observed that there is support in view of allowing appeal in arbitration. Further, the working group also observed that it is prevalent and therefore, you don't require a provision in ANSITRAL to legalize it. That means it is already prevalent. And since it is not prohibited in ANSITRAL model law, so therefore, it can be validly continued. It is prevalent in commodity trade for many years. Traders incorporate arbitration clause in which they provide for appeal mechanism. How can it be said that it is not permitted in Arbitration Act? How can it be said that it is prohibited? Now, if you recall, I said that initially the matter was listed before a smaller bench of two judges. And both the judges, in their opinions, have written, when they referred the matter to a larger bench, in their opinions, they have referred to good number of high court cases in which high courts have allowed such two-tier arbitration agreements to be valid arbitration agreement under Indian law. Now, there are references where ANSITRAL working group has observed that this is prevalent, this is popular, there is support for two-tier arbitration. There are instances in India where high courts have permitted two-tier arbitration. Now, when Parliament was making Arbitration Conciliation Act, we don't challenge the legislative wisdom of Parliament. When Parliament was enacting the Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, it knew about the practices which continued. 
it knew about those high court decisions of of a period prior to 1996 which were identified by the two judges bench of the supreme court parliament also knew about it parliament also knew about had 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 access to the observation of the ancestral despite knowing that this is prevalent parliament preferred not to prohibit it in arbitration conciliation act means what it is not prohibited if they wanted to prohibit it let us examine the legislative intent if parliament really wanted to prohibit two tier arbitration they could have done it by using as many words which they have not done despite knowing the observation of ancestral working group despite knowing about those high court cases where they have allowed it this also proves that it is not prohibited in arbitration conciliation act it was also argued that the arbitration conciliation act 1996 is a self contained code and anything not provided for is not permitted this has been observed by the supreme court in 2011 judgment fures day loss and limited versus jindal exports in which supreme court has held that arbitration act is a self contained code and anything that is not provided for is not permitted so therefore in order to see whether it is permitted within the act you will have to see whether it is expressly mentioned provided this argument cannot be sustained Yes, Arbitration Conciliation Act is a consolidating act. It is a consolidating act. But one cannot say that anything which is not mentioned here is not contemplated, is not provided, will never become part of it. No, because you cannot expect Parliament to contemplate all possibilities and mention about it. For example, when we will discuss Section Eleven, we will see that Parliament has written about. method to appoint one arbitrator section 11 also talks about method to appoint three arbitrators it does not provide method to appoint five arbitrators should we conclude that therefore there cannot be five arbitrators or should we extend the method of three arbitrators even in cases of five arbitrators yes so therefore you cannot expect the parliament to visualize and contemplate anticipate all eventualities and provide for all those things no it is not possible there is another judgment of 2002 called as iti limited this is siemens public communications network limited 2002 this was a case in relation to applicability of provision of cpc this is a case in relation to applicability of provisions of cpc it was held that since there was no express provision excluding the code it shall apply so there are conflicting opinions there is one judgment which says it is unless it is expressly provided for it is not permitted there is another judgment which says as long as it is not excluded it is permitted so therefore what court says court relies on the second judgment the iti limited judgment and says that even if we accept that it is a complete code still it is difficult to accept that something which is not prescribed is prohibited no that is not accepted what we can say is something which is not prohibited is permissible is the acceptable proposition and since two tier arbitration agreements are not prohibited parliament has preferred not to expressly prohibit it means what it is permissible it is allowed there are other grounds under section 34 under section 35 but court dismissed those arguments based on section 34 and section 35 so therefore there is no bar in arbitration conciliation act there is no prohibition against two tier arbitration clause the fourth point was this would mean violation of public policy of india allowing two tier arbitration clauses would mean violation of public policy of india meaning of public policy of india has changed over the years but when this case was decided the meaning which we had i'll mention that meaning violation of public policy of india means violation of fundamental policy of indian law no policy of indian law is going to be violated by two tier arbitration court says second 
violation of public policy of india means violation of interest of india interest of india in international context economic interest political interest again this is not acceptable allowing two tier arbitration agreement will not violate any of the interests of india third it is against justice or morality no two tier arbitration clause is not immoral it is not against notion of justice fourth is it patently illegal court says no so therefore two tier arbitration clause is valid because it is not prohibited by any of the provisions of the act it does not amount to violation of public policy of india what we discussed in this session is there are two important principles one is the principle of incorporation by reference and we also saw how this principle was expanded in the case of messrs inox the second aspect we discussed was examining validity of two tier arbitration agreement court has held such agreements to be valid in the next lecture we will talk about section 8 i have already mentioned that if there is no agreement there cannot be an arbitration second point if there is an agreement there has to be arbitration the second point will be discussed in the next lecture that's all for this session thank you very much Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said but also in what remains unsaid. Today I'll be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered and indeed the very charm of this particular story that i'm going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends it is an ancient tale from mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of somerset mom stands out uh, the adaptation that i'll be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that mom wrote The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed the servant had all gone white and trembling with fear he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace When I entered the market the servant said to his master I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her I saw that she was death I am very scared master because death looked at me with a threatening gesture Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death The master being a good man gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? asked the master to death. And death replied, "It was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today." 
because this evening I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.